everybody, thanks for watching Make Me Smart on YouTube. Subscribe. There's a little link down below so you never miss an episode. I don't know why I was looking up at the red dot. Look at the lens, Kai. There you go. <laughs> you know. Oh, look, That's there rather it is. nice. There it is. <clears throat> wow. There it is. Hello, everyone. I'm Molly Wood. I was waiting for the sigh. (laughs) I cannot be. It's Pavlovian. Hello, everyone. It's Molly Wood. I'm Kai Rizdal. We are back, actually live with Make Me Smart, the weekly podcast. Bah! The weekly podcast. I know, right? Live. The weekly podcast we do here at Marketplace. It's about tech, the economy, and culture, where, as we say, when we can get the words out of our mouths, none of us is as smart as all of us. That's right. We are finally back. It's been a long break. It was like an extra week tacked on because I had to go to CES. Uh, we know you missed us. We missed you too. <laughs> but what happened in Vegas stays in Vegas. Right. And so we're back for our re- <laughs> exactly not a word. Uh, we are back in the studio, our respective studios for our. For- I will say that at CES, whenever the topic of Make Me Smart comes up, which is pretty much with which ev- with everyone that yeah. I talk to, yeah. they all ask the same question, which what? is like, "Are you guys in the same room?" Oh, that's too funny. Everyone. That's too everyone. Funny. Are you in the same room? Watch nope. the video, people. And when we are. It's weird. Yeah, it is weird. It is weird. It's so yep. weird. It's like I can't really Don't know where to look. Yeah, but that's a whole different yep. thing. That's probably Anyway, weird. we're back. It's our first real episode of the we're new back. year. We hope not to disappoint. And we are, in case you hadn't uh, checked the calendar lately, in 2020. It's a presidential election year. We have 10 and a half-ish, 11-ish months to go. Uh, and so we are going to do, as we find it appropriate, some election coverage. Uh, because, oh my goodness, there's a lot of it and, and we don't want to get lost in the crowd. Um, we're going to do, uh, election security. We're going to do disinformation campaigns. We're going to do the big tech and all of that today. And we're going to start it, uh, with a woman who spent New Year's day, 2020, tweeting out a big pile of leaked documents relating to Cambridge Analytica. If you remember that story, um, we all do, I believe Ms. Wood. (laughs) Yeah, it's back. Uh, but quick refresher in case you forgot or just arrived on this planet. Uh, in 20, in 2018, we found out that Cambridge Analytica had been, harvesting people's Facebook profiles and then selling the data to primarily conservative political campaigns in order to create what they were calling these psychographically targeted, extremely personalized, often false or misleading, but not always, advertisements promoting candidates like Donald Trump, the pro-Brexit campaign, all kinds of issues and personalities. Um, And our guest today actually worked for Cambridge Analytica. Her name is Brittany Kaiser. And after that story broke, she was actually subpoenaed by the Mueller committee and by the UK Parliament. Now she has her own campaign going. It's called Hindsight 2020. It's basically uh, happening on Twitter. And the Twitter handle is Hindsight is 2020. And she has been releasing tons of new Cambridge Analytica documents to the press, trying to alert people to the scope of these operations because it's happening globally and really represents an effort to, in some cases, undermine democracy all around the world. And and it is not by any means over. I mean, you know, we've had the 2016 election story here in the news for, well, since 2016, um, but it's still going on. And that's why we have her on the pod today. Uh, uh, and and I guess with that, we toss the guest. Br- Brittany Kaiser, welcome to <laughs> welcome to Make Me Smart. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you guys so much for having me. So uh, just, just to sort of set the stage here, um, how worried ought we be uh, about 2020? Well, I hope that you're as worried as I am. <laughs> That's why I'm on this campaign called Hindsight is 2020, because if we look back at 2016, and the amount of work that campaigners and activists and investigators and journalists like yourselves have done on issues of disinformation and fake news and the problems between election intervention and technology, especially platforms like Facebook, somehow I do not see enough improvements to protect ourselves ahead of 2020. In fact, I really think that between now and the election, we're going to see things a lot worse than what we saw in 2016. Can you... Give us some examples. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. you've been putting up these mm-hmm. documents that show us these sort of global campaigns that are ongoing, that happened uh, from 2016 to be- and before. Tell us, just, you know, lay the groundwork for people who are not aware of how these campaigns work and, and how widespread they are. Yeah, of course. I, I think the biggest issues that we're facing right now are that most people are not digitally literate enough to see 
uh, or understand what they're seeing on their social media feeds, understand what they're seeing on their phones and their laptops every day. They don't understand the amount of money that goes into paying for ads, paying for content that doesn't even look like advertisements, and that this content might be not only misleading, but purposefully fake news. And now the largest communications and advertising platform in the world, Facebook, has decided that politicians and political advertising are not going to be moderated by Facebook, meaning that the community standards that you and I are held to, including not using disinformation or fake news, not inciting violence, not using inflammatory content, those same standards are not going to be applied to politicians because what they say is considered newsworthy. Now, Jack Dorsey has fought back against this and said that while there isn't the artificial intelligence, technology, or human capacity to police disinformation, he's shutting off political advertising altogether, except for basic needs such as registering people to vote. Unfortunately, Mark Zuckerberg has done the opposite and made us more vulnerable than we were in the last election. Okay, but is it Mark Zuckerberg's job? I mean, he's the CEO of a private company. Are, are we comfortable with him just saying, nope, can't do it? So I think the big problem with the debate these days is that he seems to say that this is about censorship or the right to free speech. But you know what? The right to free speech ends where another person's human rights begin. So I cannot use my right to free speech in order to slander or defame someone. I cannot use my right to free speech for racist, racist sexist, or violent rhetoric. I cannot use my right to free speech in order to suppress your vote. But unfortunately, that's what some politicians and political campaigns are using Facebook for. I, I, I and can, I think Mark Zuckerberg is denying the problem. I can say racist and sexist things if I want to. First Amendment says I can. Uh, not technically. Um, no, not, not according to community standards. You are usually ah, banned from ah, social media for doing that. Gotcha. So you and I don't have the same rights as Donald Trump does in order to incite that type of hatred, unfortunately. Right. Um, I want to drill into the tech. We're going to like double team this a little bit. Tell me how it works. Like I'm looking at, you know, um, one of the documents about Brazil from 2017, big data firm Cambridge Analytica to target Brazil's dissatisfied middle class. Because I think this is the part that people don't always understand, right? That, that this was about reaching people on this emotional level and crafting messages that appeal directly to that. So how what does that look like? What does that start to look like for a member of the dissatisfied middle class? Right. You're exactly right to point that out, because I think most people are not aware of the amount of personal information about them that is available for sale. So everything that you read, where you travel to, what you purchase, what you do on holiday with your family, all of these different things play into what companies like Cambridge Analytica are able to purchase about you. So because they can buy and license that information, they can either work with psychologists or data scientists to basically understand everything about your personality, the way you see the world, the way you make decisions, what makes you excited, what makes you angry. And that allows companies to craft messages that are made to engage you. And it might not be positive engagement, which obviously is great for something like registering people to vote, but instead it can be negative engagement. So it can make you angry at another group of people or another politician or political party. It can make you angry about society or even so angry at the political system that you decide not to vote at all. And that's where the voter suppression tactics come in that were definitely used in the Brazilian election in support of Bolsonaro, as well as in the Trump campaign. So is the right answer for governments to try to figure out how to regulate this? What's the right answer? That's definitely the right answer. Um, I, I'm sorry to say it, but we have given a lot of big tech executives the time to try to solve this themselves. And unfortunately, they don't always make the ethical decision. So they have to be forced to new legislation and new regulation in order to make sure that citizens and users are protected is the only answer that we have right now. You, I mean, obviously you, GDPR and CCPA are great, but it's hard to implement it without the tech companies actually being involved in implementation. Right. So GDPR is in Europe. CCPA is in the state of California. You have, of course, met the Congress of the United States, though, which cannot find its backside with both hands. 
<laughs> well, I think for the federal level, legislation is going to take a little bit longer. Everybody's waiting to see how this goes in California. And luckily, some of the amazing legislators in the state of California have even already written in addition to CCPA that includes a $10 million assistance fund for any companies, especially startups, that need assistance complying with the new laws. I think there's going to be a lot of handholding over the next few years to make sure that companies of all sizes can be easily compliant and government departments, to be fair. This isn't just for nonprofits, uh, not just for for profit companies. Mm -hmm. What does the regulation look like? I mean, mm -hmm. we've seen, you know, uh, the big three social media companies in the US take three pretty dramatically different. Uh, stances on political advertising is is there like one fix that you would start with well i definitely think that jack dorsey has made the right decision to pause uh, political advertising while he figures out how to moderate it because mm. it's very much a technology solution as well as extra human capacity as well but if we can develop the technology to identify disinformation and fake news, then it's going to be much more scalable. You know, I can't blame Facebook and Twitter and other platforms for growing a lot faster and having problems that they never expected to, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm not putting that completely on them. I totally understand those uh, growing pains in a way. But unfortunately, you know, companies like Facebook have been investing money almost in the wrong places. Mark Zuckerberg has come out and said that he is spending a ton of money and investment on foreign intervention in elections, whereas Russia was proven to only have spent a couple hundred thousand dollars in intervening in 2016, whereas the Trump campaign and super PACs likely spent well over a billion dollars and spent a lot of that money pushing out disinformation and fake news. So really, the biggest threat to our democracy is domestic, not foreign. I wonder if the biggest threat to our democracy isn't uninformed voters, voters who are not uh, diligent enough in taking care to make sure that the information they get is reasonable. I totally agree with you. And I think the lack of digital literacy or intelligence about media literacy to understand what you're consuming is a huge problem. You know, I, I recently started the Own Your Data Foundation to do digital literacy training. So we are teaching people what their data rights are and how to enforce them, basic cybersecurity protocols, how to protect your privacy if you want it, how to be ethical to other people on social media, how to spot disinformation and fake news, or for kids, how to spot cyberbullying and protect yourself from it. These are all things that people should probably know, especially children should know before they get their first device. But we didn't see a lot of these problems coming when we invented a lot of these devices. So this is a completely new sector of training and of education that is going to become a lot more important than other subject areas, considering that we're basically forced to live a digital life and nearly forced to get all of our information online these days. How big a deal, since so much of this started with targeting um, mm -hmm. and the idea of like hyper precise targeting based on your feelings, mm -hmm. how big a deal is it that Facebook won't limit that? Like, it's one thing to say we should be a digitally literate population, but if ads can be targeted to 20 people, you know, as few as 20 people who were specifically mm -hmm. picked because they're not very digitally literate, for example, how could we possibly combat that? Like, what is the technology that has to go hand in hand with the learning? Yeah, I totally see your point there. I definitely think that micro targeting down to minuscule numbers of people is a massive threat because it means that everybody has a different version of reality. So what I see is different to what my sister or my parents see, different to my colleagues, the person sitting next to me on the train. All of us will see a completely different version of the news, of even memes and gifs that get sent around, of uh, different bylines. I mean, even some very legitimate news organizations have different titles to their articles depending on who's seeing it or who's clicking on it. So when you think about that, you realize that when social scientists say that America is more divided than we ever have been before, and that Congress votes uh, less uh, bipartisan than ever before, 
now we kind of understand why because algorithms that decide what we see on social media are driving us apart and driving us to a point where we don't even understand each other because none of us are receiving the same information. So I definitely think limiting micro-targeting, especially in political campaigns, is very important. And I challenge Facebook to actually show us an entire library of every single ad that was targeted and how it was mm -hmm. targeted. Was it targeted to uh, different groups based on race or gender or location? I'd really like to know that and see if they can be fully transparent. Right. <laughs> Which surprisingly has not been part of the transparency effort. Um, <laughs> right. uh, sort of. Well, on that note, though, we should also note that the efficacy of these ads, whether they actually work, is in some dispute still, right? Like having been on the inside of Cambridge Analytica, there is this idea that that some politicians might have been sold more efficiency than they got. Like, does it really work? So I think a lot of the questions that have run around the efficiency have to do with how useful psychographic targeting is, as opposed to more generic targeting that's done on demographics. So your age, your gender, your location, which are more typical groups that are targeted or, you know, a, a campaign for the youth, a campaign for women or a campaign for rich people. That, that's normally what gets done in traditional politics. But now you can add so many different data points together and create using, using artificial intelligence, hundreds or thousands of different messages within the same campaign, slightly adjusted down to, you know, hundreds or thousands of data points about you. That's where it, it starts to get a, a little bit dangerous and talking about how we prevent that is is really difficult. But when you're talking about how are we going to measure the effectiveness of this? Well, in Cambridge Analytica, we saw that sometimes there were 20 or 30 percent uplift in engagement when psychographics were used. I, ha I do have to admit, though, that not all psychographics are very useful. Uh, some psychographic groupings, as in uh, open minded people or agreeable people, uh, agreeable people care more about their family and their community than they care about themselves. Targeting these individuals was not that useful. But if you were targeting neurotics, so people that are emotionally unstable or react well to fear-based messaging, if you sent scary messages or fear-based messaging to people modeled to be neurotic, that was incredibly successful. Hmm. And that's the darkest part of all of this, that the negative campaigning using psychographics was the most successful achievement, I suppose you could say, uh, of Cambridge Analytica's work with psychologists. So do you feel like the, the takeaway then is if, so, if you see an ad that seems like it's designed to try to make you angry or scared, <laughs> you, should, you should just run a quick DuckDuckGo search and make sure it's true? <laughs> I, I would completely agree with you. I think that's the best thing you could do for yourself to say, okay, this makes me feel angry. Why do I feel angry? Is it because of a belief I already had? Or is it because this title of this article or this meme that one of my friends shared makes me feel angry about something that I cannot yet confirm? And just do a double take. <laughs> Give yourself a minute and a breather and think more critically about what you're seeing and why. Has someone paid to put that in front of you because they're trying to persuade you or manipulate you to believe what they want you to believe? Because right now, that's more likely than not. Brittany Kaiser is operating the Hindsight is 2020 campaign at Hindsight Files on Twitter and wrote Targeted, my inside story of Cambridge Analytica and how Trump and Facebook broke democracy. Thanks, Brittany. Brittany, thanks a lot. Thank you guys so much. Have a good day. You too. So there you go, right? Or we're, we're either screwed or it's all going to work out. Is that is that where we come out of that one? Yeah, I mean, something kind, like that, right? I guess. Which is sort of always, right? Always the yeah. always the yeah. state of being. <laughs> I, I I haven't right. put it in. <laughs> I haven't put it in yet, but I do have a uh, news fix that is totally related to this. Um, all right. About the negative negativity bias, which is what's super interesting. Um, huh. But yes, yeah. I I think I mean. I think that question of the efficacy is fascinating and the fact that they got so much engagement when, I mean, because when you see campaigns that are entirely based on fear and then yeah. you find out that these fear-based emails, for example, um, according to Brittany's research, have a 20% higher open rate right. than emails that are like, everything is going to be okay. 
you realize that messaging I don't know. I don't know how it changes yeah. exactly, but it gets it's it's I don't know. Yeah, it's and disturbing. and and look, I'm going to get yelled at by people for saying, well, um, you know, American consumers and the electorate are just simply not informed enough, and I get that that's a really tough thing to be right now. But you have to overcome those baser instincts of fear and fight or flight and all that jazz to to make this make sense because it's really hard and there's sophisticated operations happening. Yep. That are trying to manipulate that fear right. and anger. Exactly. Yep. Yep. All right. So, look, all if right. you are filtering your news feed or uh, just, you know, taking it all in and saying, oh, yeah, definitely, that guy's bad, um, let us know. Make me smart. Marketplace.org. Send us an email, voice memo, whatever you want. We'll be right back. Hmm. Welcome back. <laughs> Jazz hands. <laughs> Jazz hands. Uh, we're back. We're back. And we are ready. I know it didn't seem like I was ready, but we're ready for <laughs> our first, first news fix of 2020. Maybe my news resolution should have been like, don't forget to put in your link for the news fix. I, I would, I would, this, this RT would Just be as one, That's all one option. That's all uh -huh. I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you want to go first? What do you want? Um, sure. Mine is related, okay. actually. Right. And ahead. also, I want to spend a little more time on yours. I saw this great uh, piece in the Wall Street Journal, which is, yes, behind a firewall, uh, paywall, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but it's based on a book that is coming out about the negativity bias. So the whole article uh... was about the negativity bias. Yeah. And how psychologists, like really only in the last 10 or 20 years, probably two decades, have been have been really studying this negativity effect and i actually did not realize it was going to be so relevant to the conversation we just had but it basically says there's like psychologists can't find they know that our brains respond to negative stimuli like we know that we obsess over criticism from one person more than praise from a hundred hmm. but they can't find compelling counter examples of like good stuff being stronger. They basically are, are realizing it's sort of a rule of four. Like if a bad thing happens, it takes four good things to overcome that bad thing. It's partly why uh, in workplaces, they've determined that like one negative person, one person with sort of toxic negativity will easily infect an entire office because it's such a powerful impact compared to positivity, which is its own kind of depressing. Um, but it's really interesting because it creates this kind of methodology for well, counteracting it. So so let's continue with my theory on consumers need, be, need to be better educated. Now that we know that, right, consumers and yeah. news, now that we know that, what do we do about it? Exactly. Uh, no, I'm like, I you. guess we have to counteract it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I do think I have started to try to train myself when I see a thing on Twitter that I want to get outraged about yeah. to stop and, and look it up. I mean, I really have well, sincerely there, there you go, that. right? Sort that's, of like, that's step one. This, that's the simplest thing. But honestly, this stuff needs to be like, to Brittany's point about education, this needs to be curriculum. Like we live in the yeah. digital age. Yeah. Kids need to be, this needs to be in schools. A conversation but, about, you know, digital communication, how to spot misinformation, cyber literacy, cyber security, privacy data sharing like i would i mean maybe we should that's, do this maybe this that's should actually that's like actually a, a really good that's a really good idea it's a really good idea and it would totally resonate uh with a lot of parents that i know the catch of course is that there's a whole other cohort of parents who would say no god damn it my need my kid needs algebra and history 101 to get into you know harvard right sure they can figure out but, this online stuff themselves that's easy I know, which is absurd because then every parent will also be at home saying like, I just, they're on their phone all the time. I right, can't get them right, off the phone. Right, I don't know what right. they're doing on the phone. Like, oh, oh, really? Do you think maybe mm -hmm. you would like school to help with that too? Yeah. Maybe they could actually get into a better college if they didn't spend all their time like, you know, playing Skyblocks, my son. Yep. Oh, God. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, they're, they're, I actually, I'm tempted. Email us and let us know what you think about this idea. The book is going to be coming out soon. I think it's called The Power of Bad how the negativity effect rules us and how we can rule it. And I'm like obsessed, hmm. literally obsessed with it. Hmm. Interesting. Yep. Yeah. <sighs> okay. My turn. So and then, yeah, your turn. All right. Uh, I had, I had two and then I windowed them down. The first one was the whole um, department of really? justice wanting help from Apple on iPhones again, which I just think is really oh, yeah. interesting and plays a little bit into what we were talking about a little bit. I mean, I'm game. We can uh, talk about that. No, no, no. I don't want to. Uh, cause, <laughs> cause we sort of hashed that one out already or we have anyway. Um, okay. uh, Larry Fink, uh, BlackRock, 
It's a big uh, uh, money management firm uh, in New York, $7 trillion under management. And Larry Fink, the CEO, came out today and said, look, companies, um, we will not vote in favor of whatever shareholder propositions you have unless you take into effect climate change. And this is a big, Mm -hmm. big deal. This is a mountain of money that Larry Fink controls talking now to corporate America, saying you must take climate change into um, your decision making. And uh, it will be really interesting to see if people pay attention. It's going to take years. You know, but, it, you know. it's going to take years. One thing I found kind of interesting is that some people were um, a little skeptical of this because they said, like, oh, most of what BlackRock does is passive investing and not active investing. Mm-hmm. And it might not have that much impact. But one of the things they did say is that they're going to offer passive investment funds mm-hmm. like those targeted funds. I'm going to retire, I, I hope, in 2320. Um, but that those funds could essentially be sustainability focused or not mm-hmm. include fossil fuel companies. And I think that is a huge deal yeah. for people's retirement packages. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think this is really interesting. And I think that there's a lot to be done on investor pressure. I mean, certainly this raises the simple fact that companies and massive investment firms are picking up where the U.S. government is is leaving, not only leaving off, but actively moving in the opposite direction. Yeah. But that companies are saying, Listen, like take whatever philosophical stance you want with respect to climate change. The fact is that risk assessment is real Mm -hmm. and we simply cannot continue to do business without recognizing the fundamental risk that climate poses economically. Yeah. And And like there's all these. Yeah, I think this is fascinating. I think it's going to be totally interesting to see what happens. And and as I said, it's going to take years. But the catch is I don't think these companies actually have years because there's a whole cohort coming up behind it. Well, certainly behind you, but also behind me just because I'm a little older um, that um, that for whom for whom this is a big, big deal. I was true story. I was sitting in my living room the other day reading. My daughter comes over. She's 12 and she turns off the light. And I'm like, babe, what? And she said, Dad, climate. Yeah, I don't, we don't, we, mm-hmm. you don't need more electricity burning in this house. And I was like, all right, fine. You know, I mean, that's, the, it's like innate for these kids is what I'm saying. It absolutely it. is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they are so aware of it yeah. as a crisis in a way yeah. that, that we n- aren't necessarily, and that, you know, their own lawmakers are not yeah. recognizing. But yeah, I, I actually read a piece just this week about flight shaming. Oh yeah. And how oh, yeah. the CEO of an airline was talking about how her own kids are like, oh, we don't think you should fly so much. Yeah, you should probably, uh, you know, get your emissions down, yep. and you don't need to take yep. that flight. Yep. No, it's a, it's a. I mean, you know, like our our policymakers can go in whatever direction they want, but everybody else is paddling the other way. All y'all weigh in, uh, and while you're doing that, uh, think about uh, our newsletter sent every Friday morning. Yes. A digestible dose of stories from the week, plus some surprising facts and figures. Also, occasionally commentaries from Molly and me and uh, folks who work here and, and help get us uh, to the microphones. Uh, marketplace.org slash newsletter. Sign up. It's a good one. It is a delight. Now let's do the mailbag. Oh, man. Hi, Kai and Step Molly. On this is Brent. In man, this is Rebecca. I didn't think I was going to get it there. It was great to hear comments on my question about that I abandoned the script I completely. I wanted to put in my vote. I want to discuss a slightly different but maybe related thing. But maybe related. Maybe related. Um, in one of our episodes before the break, which we actually had a lot of feedback about, we asked an economist to explain why the economy needs to keep growing. We talked about how GDP is not the only way to measure a successful economy. And some countries, for example, have a four-day work week. Hope springs eternal. (laughs) Here's listener Alex Anderson's take on that conversation. Hi, Kai and Molly. This is Alex from Dallas, Texas. On your show with Mr. Bevins, he mentioned an increase in leisure time and change to a four-day work week as examples of positive benefits from economic redistribution. In my mind, those who benefit from these kind of changes are already in middle-class white-collar jobs. By white collar in this context, I mean those whose work schedules and days off are fixed. Those who work in service jobs, such as fast food restaurants and grocery stores, have inconsistent weekly schedules because they are based on a combination of employer demand for coverage and other employees' schedule availability. Due to these factors, schedules are made weekly and are rarely ever consistent to where a four-day work week would be possible. My question is, wouldn't these kind of policies exacerbate the economic divide even more and make worse the problem it seeks to fix? Thanks, guys. Well, um, yes. Mm-hmm. You know, yes. Mm-hmm. Right. That's a good point. Uh, and, yep. and there's a whole tranche of work to be done on lower income service sector jobs to get them to the place where 
um, they can have these kinds of benefits that people in upper management and management and middle management jobs can get. That's absolutely true. So, yes. Yeah. I mean, fundamentally, this is a question of wages. That's, full stop. That's exactly right. Yeah. Right. I, I think I saw a piece the other day that said even a $1 increase in the minimum wage dramatically reduces uh, like suicides and alcohol deaths and mental illness. I mean, the the level of stress that that people are feeling as a result of not getting paid enough mm -hmm. can't be overstated. Yep. Different topic. Kind of dark place. Christmas yeah. trees. Moving right along. There we go. It's too early yeah. in the year to be that dark. Um, we <laughs> did know. a thing. Uh, we did a thing on Christmas trees for the break, uh, and we asked you to tell us whether you bought a fake tree or a real one. We did a highly unscientific poll. The results are in. Ten listeners wrote in to say they prefer fake trees. Eight people wrote in to say real. So slight preference for fake among y'all. And frankly, uh, I'm disgusted with you. I think fake trees are gross. <laughs> I'm just saying that. Please keep, please keep listening. Please keep listening. But I'm, I'm disappointed in you. That's all I have. He's not mad. That's, that's He's just disappointed. All right. Um, uh, Our next voice memo. <laughs> Go ahead. Comes to us from Bria Fleming, who has... A comment unrelated to uh, fake Christmas trees and not unrelated to today's interview. Mm -hmm. Hi, Kai and Molly. I'm calling today with a question about marketing and data aggregation. My example is my husband and I have no plans to have children and I am not pregnant. But all of a sudden I started getting all kinds of emails about infant products. And today in the mail, I even received an unsolicited package for baby formula. Mm -hmm. This is super weird and creepy. I'd hate to think of my mother-in-law getting a hold of this false information. And I'm wondering if my identity has been stolen or if this is less insidious. A quick Google shows that it happens to all kinds of people. And I want to know how you can make it stop. All right. I have a theory. In the, I have a theory, Molly, and then I want you to fact check me. My theory is that somebody out there, the, the Internet knows uh, uh, Bria's age. They know mm -hmm. roughly where she lives. They know that a lot mm -hmm. of women her age, where she lives, get pregnant. Bang, she must be thinking about having a baby. Yeah, I think that's a huge part of it. Yeah. it absolutely. Like, it's simple demographics yeah. is part of the reason. They're just like, yeah. oh, you must want to have a baby now, which, yep. thanks a lot, society. Bite me. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's I, also I possible. I think you just got us the E. I don't, know, I don't know how that happened, but okay. Well, uh, bite me? That's I, a perfectly... Acceptable -ish I'm, 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 I'm going to, to Urban Dictionary and see if okay, go oh, ahead. Oh, that Moving is right not an E. Oh, okay. Anyway, all right, Dad. <laughs> can you say it on the radio, <laughs> Mollywood? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, yes, you can say it on the radio. I mean, I'm not going to say Should it you? again. Hmm. Now anyway, I'm all sorry. worried. Yeah. Anyway, thanks a lot, society. Is what I meant to say. It's also possible, and this is how we know that the machines are not going to take our jobs. That like you bought someone a baby present. Right. So right. now, totally. you know, the Internet thinks you're having a baby. Um, as to the question about whether you can make it stop, if you live in California, you suddenly, as of January 1st, have the right to write to companies and ask them to delete all your data. Yeah. Which is a fun exercise that I kind of want to do as a radio story. You know, it's story. funny. We should, yeah, I was going to say you should do it yep. for the radio, but we should also do a little yep. primer here on, on California being the leading edge of what could happen based on, uh, you know, some of the things Brittany said about whether or not that might get adopted. Let me just detour here briefly to encourage everybody who's uh, of legal age to look up the Urban Dictionary definition of, of that thing that Molly just said. And uh -oh. you, you tell me if it's an E or not. Anywho, moving okay, right along. Urban Dictionary is one <clears throat> big E. So, so, here we go. Okay. The Make Me Smart question. CCPA. <laughs> this week, oh. um, Liz Oppenheim, here we go. Something I thought I knew but later found out I was wrong about is why I should support reparations and affirmative action. My family came to this country in the wave of immigrants in the early 1900s, well after slavery ended. So I used to think that reparations and affirmative action were not my responsibility, and I was generally against these ideas, which sort of embarrassed me as a liberal. In the last few years, however, I'm learning how much my family, even though as Italians and Jews, they weren't exactly welcomed, benefited from the systemic racism present in this country. Whether it was programs such as redlining, which helped them access housing, preference and acceptance at prestigious schools, or just a life free from constant racial discrimination, my way in the world was always made much easier. Now I am in full support of both reparations and affirmative action as an aid to closing the wealth gap that only continues to grow. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it yep. all does continue to grow. That's a fact. 
It does. I appreciate this, that historical revelation. I think that's, it's something that it's like, it's not an obvious one-to-one. And I actually think Liz laid it out really well that yeah. like the baseline was laid in a way that we aren't always aware of at all. Yeah, totally. So well articulated. I, so, are we getting more aware of it? Do you think? I don't, I, I, yes and no. I mean, black and brown people have been aware. Yeah, well, yeah. I think some, S- you know, white, white guy, people right. are yeah, starting. No, exactly, yeah. yeah. Right, like, so what's happening now is that some white people are becoming right. aware. Right. And that's all, that ultimately is the thing that really matters is not just awareness, but also action. But like, yeah. remember when we had um, Sam on? Sam Sanders, yeah. Sam from, Sanders from, on. Uh, uh, it's been a minute. The yes, podcast, exactly. Yeah. And he, yeah. man, that was just a blank. Sam Sanders came on yeah. and talked about the Overton window yeah. and talked about how he did not think that there would be a time in his adult life when presidential candidates were talking about mm-hmm. reparations. But mm-hmm. that is all like the, you know, that's all the awareness all, campaign starting to work. Totally. But you know what's really interesting now? Cory Booker's gone. Kamala Harris is gone. I, I, I mean, yeah. who else was raising that uh, on the campaign trail? And it's been months since that's been a topic. And and look, there's a debate tonight, it's Tuesday night, there's a debate in Iowa, and it's six white people. I mean, you know, but let's not go down that road, because... Sure, but every drop yeah. every drop yep. helps fill the bucket of yep. awareness. For sure. And for including sure. including this answer, actually, yep. from, from Liz. Yep. Good job, Liz. Yeah, that was great. Okay, yep. uh, let's see, a couple more things. Um, that's it for us today, we're done. Don't uh, forget to check out our One Minute Explainers on your Amazon smart speaker. They are fresh every single day, me and Molly. Just tell your Echo device to make me smart. And it'll start Please, talking. Please, Echo it'll device. Weird. Make me smart. No one else can. <laughs> Wait, that's not true. <laughs> we can too. Make Me Smart is produced and directed by Sam Anderson. Our digital producer is Tony Wagner, and our senior producer is Jody Becker. Thanks to our video producer Ben Hethcote and our new video intern Ethan Yay! Peretz. Yay! And thank you to writer producer uh, writer producer Erica Phillips, who puts together the newsletter and is just she a does. delight in Slack. Well, there you go. And that, that's that's validation for you right there. This week's program was engineered by Daniel Ramirez. Our theme music was composed by Ben Talladay and Daniel Ramirez as well. The executive director of On Demand is Tarnieves. The senior vice president and general manager, last time I checked, is Deborah Clark. <laughs> I, I think know. she was in a meeting today, right? Uh, uh, yeah, Going she by was that in title, meeting, Roughly? But, you know, I'm just yeah, checking to see yeah. if she's listening. Uh-huh. That's all I'm saying. Hi, boss. She pops, like, she pops up like every three or four months and says, yes, I'm I know. Listening. You never know. You never know? Never know. One never knows. Do one. The shadow knows. Strategic unpredictability should be a tool in every manager's toolbox. <laughs> True story. I used to work for a guy who was like, sometimes you need to just flip out. Oh, that's like, interesting. Like, you never know. Like, yeah, he was like, people shouldn't know when it's coming. You don't want to regularly flip out, but occasionally a strategic temper blowing is I should totally do that. super a you super useful management just tool. <laughs> All right. We good? Everybody happy? Reasonably so?